things develop within uh, this scientific community, often we have uh, the emergence of anomalies, contestations. Now you can see the harmonies now. There's no harmony anymore. Okay, things are happening within this paradigm. Uh, people do not agree anymore. They see things differently. And this is uh, then what we call a crisis within uh, this paradigm. And this leads to what Kuhn called a scientific revolution. Um, and that leads to the adoption of the new okay? this, is the, this is the way it works. Right? And once things have settled down here, we're back to normal science. So what this actually il illustrates that people do not see things the same. You can have different paradigms. Okay, so I think this is a, just a basic thing to understand about where the, the term comes from and how it works. This is your paradigm shift. The paradigm shift is very difficult to explain. They say it's irrational. It's a leap of faith. Um, but still you don't know what a paradigm is. Now we have to look, okay, let's see, what is a paradigm? Remember, it's not a life in world view. Now we say that a paradigm, <coughs> and I, I'm going to uh, refer you to some synonyms for, for the term, uh, is also uh, um, uh, referred to as a framework of thinking. It's a framework of thinking. Uh, etc. Et but this is basically what a paradigm is about. 
So in other words, when your supervisor asks you, okay, please explain your research paradigm, you have to explain your ontology, your epistemology, and like probably your, your methodology as well. Okay. Now, all of this involve, it, it involves philosophical assumptions. These are all assumptions. Assumptions about reality, assumptions about the construction of knowledge based on your view of reality, assumptions in terms of the, the approach that you take to gain this knowledge about this reality of yours, assumptions about the role of values, uh, etc. Et okay, right. You have to spell that out. I always advise my students when they work on their research paradigm is to spell out the assumptions. Every uh, paradigm involves particular assumptions. And those are the assumptions that they have to guide you through your research. Okay. And that's what they, your supervisor or your examiners will specifically look at that. Now you have been guided throughout your research by your assumptions. So for yourself, to spell them out, that's very particular. Then you know now you ground yourself. Right, any questions? Yeah, you can talk about a, a, yeah, a theory, you can say, for, so, uh, for example, somebody has a particular theory, uh, if I take Foucault, for example, okay. but Foucault's theory is not free floating. okay, it's also grounded in particular assumptions. So in other words, if you, in your research, you don't necessarily have to spell out the paradigm, but you can work with it, uh, somebody's theory. Because it also involves particular assumptions. It doesn't come from knowledge. Okay, so for example, if I have to look at Foucault, I will draw up a structuralism as a paradigm. Okay. Right, anything else? So what we have here, if we go back to Thomas Kuhn's uh, uh, picture here, you can see here, here within the scientific community, people share similar views. A similar ontology, epistemology, methodology, and multitude. Okay? Now people start to differ from one another. Okay? They start to see things differently. You've got your revolution, okay? uh, and that causes a, a crisis within this community. And that leads to the adoption of the scientific revolution and the adoption of a new paradigm. A different way of looking at reality, a different way of constructing knowledge. I think that's fairly really easy to, to explain uh, and understand. Any other questions? This is very basic. So what I will do now, I will explain to you uh, some of the, uh, the major paradigms that we work with. Um, and you will see there's a particular order to, the, to these uh, uh, major paradigms. Uh, and they will remind you of, uh, of the paradigm shifts uh, that you take place. Okay. And they say 
outside this reality is observable. Right. So in other words, to observe, we use our senses. So the scientific method that they took from the natural scientists, or the natural science, from the empiricism, and they made it applicable to uh, uh, positivism, is uh, we use observation, we observe, observation, in any number of observations. And this is the scientific method that is um, used within this paradigm. Um, verification, you observe certain things. Okay, water boils by 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, right? Uh, then you start to verify that. No, sorry. First, the hypothesis. Right? You come up with a hypothesis based on your observations. Right? Now you have to verify it. And this leads to a general law or a generalization. within the context of this particular paradigm. Okay? So you can see your, your um, in terms of your ontology, one reality which is observable. Okay? So it's possible to know this reality by means of observation. So things that do come to mind will typically be experimentation, tests, evidence, those are the type of things that they will be interested in. So in other words, to, to, to uh, um, construct knowledge, you will go through this process. Now the moment you come up with a generalization, this is according to the positivists, you will say, this is the truth. Why is it regarded as the truth? Because it was tested. You have verified it, I don't know how many times, but based on your verification, you make this assumption. You, you say, this is the truth, and this is being regarded as a fact. Okay, so the fact within the context of positivism is something that has been scientifically proven. You must listen to the words that I use because it's also a part of this particular paradigm. So this is regarded as the scientific method. So the moment you start to work with facts, you don't have to criticize or argue them. Because the, what is the assumption? The assumption is that it has already been proven. Right. Okay, so what is also significant within this context is because you um, can prove what you regard as the truth, you also say you can start to predict. You've got your generalizations, based on that you can start to predict and that gives you an amount of control. But what you also need to see here is that the positivists claim to be objective. Okay? Because remember what they said, there's one reality and I can observe this reality. So I stand here and I observe what is going on. So there's no relationship between me as the researcher and whatever I, what I observe. Okay, right. So they claim objectivity, they claim to be objective, and they also base this claim on the fact that they say they are value neutral. Very important. I'm not very familiar. 
I'm not comfortable with quantitative research. The numbers and the tables do not appeal to me. But surely they do appeal to other people. And you can justify that. But this is typically your approach. And then your methods could be many. What can you think of? What methods will you use in such a quantitative approach where your aim is to generalize? This is the research aim. The aim here is to generalize. You have to bear that in mind. those tables and numbers that I do not understand. Mm -hmm. But quasi experimental designs um, and so on. So there are different methods, but can you see there's a relationship between the methods that you choose and your approach and your paradigm? Now when you work with your research, you will always have to ask yourself this question first of all, what is the aim of my research? Because that's going to help you to position yourself. If the aim is to generalize your findings to the population or whatever, then you might, this is where you might find yourself very comfortable. Fine. Okay, so this is a particular paradigm. You can see the ontology. Can you see the axiology here? Value neutral. Values don't play a role. They don't reject the existence. Sometimes I get very interesting answers from my students. Um, it's not that people are, they don't reject the existence of values. But in this scientific endeavor here of your positivists, values do not play a role. They put them aside. And remember, there's no relationship between the researcher here and what is being researched because you claim to be objective. Okay. Any questions? So, those of you who work with numbers and tables and statistics and so on, you have to question. Uh, uh, your own approach and see whether you find yourself comfortable within this particular paradigm. Okay. And remember, if this is you, spell out your assumptions. You assume the existence of one or the other. You assume, assume that this reality is observable. Right. Okay, but bear in mind uh, Thomas Keane's little illustration of uh, paradigm shifts. The next one that I'm going to put next to this, and it actually emerged from uh, positivism, is post-positivism. Mistakes. The longest line, we can make mistakes. 
So in other words, he explained himself by saying we are fallible. mistakes, we must stop to verify. We must rather look for falsification. Okay? So that you rejected the notion of verification. Because he says, okay, how many verifications do we need to get to a, a point where we can generalize? Because it can take one falsification to turn the whole theory around. So instead of looking for verifications, he says, okay, let's rather falsify. We rather feel comfortable with verification. When I read the academic articles, I can actually see how the, the author only used verifications for whatever he or she wants to say. Okay, so looking for falsifications is actually a scary thing to do. Anyhow, he says, let's look uh, for falsifications, rather falsify. And I think the very well known um, example that is associated with, uh, with Popper. The, uh, the black swan. Um, they have observed, people have observed that all swans are white okay? when it comes to the scientific method of induction. Okay? All swans are white. Here comes the hypothesis all swans are white. We verify. Everyone that we see, it's white, it's white. So there's the generalization all swans are white. And then when they discovered Australia, they also saw for the first time a black swan. It took one observation, only one observation, to turn the whole theory upside down. And this is what Popper's argument. Uh, because we are fallible, we have a weak making states. So rather look uh, for things that can falsify your theory. Because when you find falsifications, what do you do? You eliminate errors. And as you eliminate errors, you move closer to the truth. So he spoke about the approximation